Hello, everyone. Welcome to Conscious Life Expo. It's a pleasure to be back here with all of you and see so many familiar faces. And it's a pleasure to introduce somebody very special that you all know. So you're all waiting patiently for Richard C. Hoagland. For those of you who might be new, who might not know his background, let me fill you in a little bit. Richard was Walter Cronkite's science advisor during all of the Apollo missions. He's the author of Monuments of Mars, A City on the Edge of Forever. He and Michael Barra wrote the book, Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA. Uh, he is the science advisor for Coast to Coast. He is, gosh, many things. And one of the most amazing things for me is that Richard has something that has not been seen elsewhere. It is a totally unique way of measuring torsion fields. And at one of these presentations, I'm sure you're going to hear more about it and see the actual software that measures this, something that has not been measured before. So this is, this is very impressive. And Richard's the recipient of the Angstrom Medal. Um, and if I go on and on, we're not going to have time and nobody will make dinner. So let me welcome Richard C. Hoagland and you'll find out just what might be even a, mure, a more curious October surprise that Obama might announce. Thank you, dear. I always love to have Robin introduce me because she, she knows how to vamp. <laughs> and that's a, a double entendre, so you can you know, think about that. I want to know how Ted did something that I've never had happen during a former presentation. How did he get one of the stars behind Enterprise to twinkle? Oh. See? Oh. How did you do that? It's the Pleiades. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a ton of stuff to go through and not enough time to go through it, but we'll give it a stab anyway. I mean, who, who wants dinner and a bunch of boring speeches and all that? What I'm going to try to do this afternoon is to show you that, in fact, we've got some amazing technological secrets about to be unveiled, that we, in fact, may be on the threshold of a major revelation an official revelation from this administration regarding extraterrestrial life, life on Mars, and a whole new paradigm for the 21st century ushered in on the eve of 2012, the end of the Mayan calendar. That's a lot to take in in one afternoon, and I have to do it in 90 minutes or less. So I'm going to breeze through this very quickly. We've had one, two, three, four, five, six previous landed missions on Mars. Two Vikings, Pathfinder, a Phoenix, Opportunity and Spirit, the Murr Rovers, and we now have an amazing new mission called Mars Science Laboratory with a nickname Curiosity, ostensibly given by a again, a young student. NASA has this pattern of naming spacecraft and then blaming students for doing it, <laughs> when in fact, if you really want my opinion, I think the students submit their lists of what they would like and NASA picks the one that already matches what they've already decided they want. <laughs> and the reason for that, of course, goes into the whole symbolic history of NASA, which is in this little book that Mike Barra and I wrote a few years ago, which is still available on um, Amazon and other places called Dark Mission, part of the secret history of NASA. This mission is called Curiosity. And initially, there were four, actually there were a lot more than four places. There were lots and lots of places that it was supposed to land, as you're going to see in a minute. One of the places was very close to a location on Mars, which is near and dear to my heart, i.e. Sidonia. Now, what's the Sidonia? Oh, that's right. That's where this, this thing is. Well, I now know how Ted did the stars thingy, all right? <laughs> Why does one screen have stars and the other doesn't? And don't fix it because we don't have time. It may be a harbinger of things to come. This is a 
much better version of the face on Mars than was taken by the Viking orbiter in 76. This is a composite of a daytime uh, western sunset version taken by Mars Global Surveyor, composited with an eastern sunrise shot, the only time the face has ever been imaged at dawn on Mars by a spacecraft called Mars Odyssey, named in honor of my late friend Sir Arthur C. Clarke and 2001 A Space Odyssey, which of course is a very big deal in the monuments of Mars because what I basically say in monuments is that all the stunning things that we have found on Mars that are typical and harbingers of an ancient extraterrestrial civilization were the reality side of the forerunner preview that Arthur and Stanley Kubrick gave us in the film 2001. So wasn't it interesting that some years later, I mean, I, I titled the book and I honored Arthur in monuments in the early mid 80s. In 2001, actually 2000, just before the spacecraft was going to be launched and then took nine months to get to Mars, NASA in their infinite wisdom, their opinion, uh, decided to name their spacecraft after Arthur's opus, 2001, A Space Odyssey. So the Mars Odyssey spacecraft in October of, I think, 2003 was tasked to take this picture, which is the eastern side of the face. Now notice there is stunning, incredibly reflective artificial geometry all over the dawn side. Robin and I, I, I dragged Robin kicking and screaming to the Grand Canyon at dawn one morning. <coughs> There's a little hyperbole there. To show her what mesas in a western desert, because remember, she's a New Yorker, so she's never really seen the western deserts. So there we are on the, on the rim of the Grand Canyon at dawn, having gotten out of our hotel in, in I want to call it the Montecito, but that's not the name of it. It's called the Monta Vista in Flagstaff. Very famous hotel. You should go there. It's haunted. Um, seriously, it, it's, it's an amazing hotel, right downtown Flagstaff. So we drive up pre-dawn, 50, 60 miles, something like that, to the canyon, stand out on the lawn next to El Tabar, which is this amazing old log hotel and restaurant, an amazing place, should eat there, called El Tabar. And we're watching the canyon as the sun is rising over the eastern rim and it's getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And unlike this shot, where this picture was taken when the sun was still below the horizon on Mars, it was a pre-dawn shot, no direct sunlight. The sun was, I think, two or three degrees below the horizon. And remember, from Mars, the sun is farther away, about one and a half times farther than the Earth. So sunrises are dimmer, the atmosphere is thinner, so the pre-twilight is a lot dimmer. All, all this is dim, 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 dim. And I wrote a piece on Enterprise, which is there. If you just you know, look for Enterprise dawn shots or Mars Honesty dawn shots of Sidoni, you'll find it. And I wanted to show Robin that there was zero comparison between this thing, which Sagan once called an average Martian mesa. Yeah, right. And that incredible, incredibly reflective geometry before the sun has risen. And the sunlight peering over the horizon in the pre-dawn darkness on the edge of the Grand Canyon as those mesas, which have all those wonderful Egyptian names like Isis and Egyptian temple and Osiris in the middle of the canyon. How did that ever happen? Uh, was being lit by the slowly rising dawn. No, this is not a natural Martian mesa. And it now is going to join a pantheon of other unnatural things on Mars as we move through this afternoon. Well, this is a perspective shot that was done on our early Sidonia work by a friend and colleague named Mark Carlotto at a high-tech firm out in Boston called Analytical Sciences Corporation. It was the first 3D shape from shading imagery produced um, in the public domain. I mean, the military had been using this technology for some time, but this was the first application in public. NASA now, of course, uses it all the time. But this was the first public application by Mark to the problem of Sidonia. Because not only was he able to 
change the 2D straight down images of the face into this interesting perspective shot in the computer. But he also was able to give us a perspective of this collection of objects over here on the left. This is the so-called city on Mars. The city and the face. A city full of pyramids. Well, I put all this in a book, which is now into its fifth printing and is shown, I don't know how many copies, in multiple languages all over the world. And what is in this book is actually now kind of prehistory. Because what I'm going to show you this afternoon makes this only a foreshadowing of things to come. Because not only do we now know that Sidonia is unquestionably artificial, we also know that it's not as those that appreciated the data that we laid out in monuments uh, that we had assembled, that it is artificial, but we now know that it's not like this. It's not Egyptian. It's not a bunch of stone stacked on top of each other. I can say unequivocally that the data will show you that we're looking at a high-tech place, an ancient, incredibly ancient, ruined, destroyed, adrift with the sands of Mars and time, high-tech place. This was the prelude to curiosity. Because as you can see, they had a lot of possible landing sites several years ago as they were beginning to think of this new mission, which is the most sophisticated, most complex, most comprehensive, most capable, most everything mission NASA has ever sent anywhere. And they sent it to Mars. It's in the parlance of a previous era, which I'm sure unless you are YouTube fans, you won't recognize, it's loaded for bear. Does that mean there are bears on Mars? No. <laughs> but it also was destined, as they winnowed down the process for landing it, they got down to four. Gale, Eberswald, Holden, and a place called Marwith Vallis. And this is the one I really hope they'd pick, because look where it is in relation to Sidonia. If you have a nuclear-powered car, which is what curiosity is, capable of lasting not just 90 days or 900 days, but if you project out the lifespan of the curiosity rover, this thing, conceivably with its nuclear power source, could last a hundred years on Mars. Now what do I base that on? On the survivability of previous nuclear-powered spacecraft NASA has sent into the outer reaches of the solar system. The Voyagers, for instance, are powered by the same kind of RTG, radioisotope thermoelectric generator power source, that Curiosity is powered by. And they are over 30 years old and still sending data back to Earth. There's an active control room up the street at JPL up in Pasadena with I think maybe, what, five people? And the reason they can do it now with five people, and it took hundreds before when the mission is because the computer technology has gotten so sophisticated and the algorithm so semi-intelligent and the redundancy so incredibly redundant that now, as I've been saying for many, many years, you can run one of these missions with five guys in a basement. And I'm not being chauvinist, but it's very rare that the black ops crowd include women, so we won't go, go there. The fact is, up at JPL, masterminded by a mission controller who is a woman, there is this tiny team of three or four people, maybe five, that are in charge of the Voyager spacecraft even now, in the 21st century, over 30 years after they were launched back in 1976 and 77. And they're still sending data home. Well, they're powered by nuclear power the same power source that is powering Curiosity. So based on the incredible longevity of the MER rovers, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, which were powered by solar power, remember they were supposed to only last 90 days, that was their quote warranty, and Opportunity is still going, and, and that was, they were launched, uh, I'm sorry, they arrived on Mars in 2003, and it's now 2012, and there's no sign that Opportunity is gonna quit. Spirit has left us its spirit left us a while ago, 
But the Opportunity rover is still going strong, and it is not built like MSL, like Curiosity. So, with that in mind, I really hope they would land at Marwith Valley because this spacecraft is loaded for bear in that ancient, ancient cliche. It has 10, 11 scientific instruments. It's got 17 cameras. The number 17, by the way, is kind of important. It's part of that secret ritual stuff NASA does all the time. That's why I really pricked up my ears the other night when um, Governor Romney suddenly said he was going to give everybody a $17,000 tax deduction. Hmm. Just before the most bewildering debate in presidential history. What was going on with that? We'll get to that at the end of the presentation. So, here we are. Previous landers. New one called Curiosity. The size of a Mini Cooper. Ever, anybody here ever ridden in a Mini Cooper? Robert Baval uh, tracked me around London one afternoon in a Mini Cooper, which is a car that's so small that you wear it, you don't get into it. <laughs> and I thought, frankly, it was the second time in my life I thought I was going to die. <laughs> the first time was when I was in a, a, a single-engine aircraft over the Grand Canyon taking pictures for a site survey for the National Space Society because we wanted to do, I wanted to do a television special vis-a-vis -vis Mars in 76 for the first landing of Viking and I thought the Grand Canyon would be perfect because, you know, Grand Canyon, Mars, Mars, Grand Canyon, you know, same, same landscape. And the engine quits. And we were below the south rim. I'm sorry, the north rim. I will not, obviously, we survived. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm a very good hologram. But, that was the first time when, you know, they say your life flashes before your eyes. Actually, it doesn't. You think about all those people that you haven't paid. <laughs> and what are they going to do? And isn't it going to be kind of interesting when they can't collect? <laughs> so the second time that my life flashed in front of my eyes was when Baval was driving me around London, which has mad traffic. Not as bad as Rome, but mad. In a Mini Cooper that, I mean, you're literally... You're wearing it. It's so small. Curiosity is the size of a Mini Cooper. It's the size of a car. It's nuclear power. It's got 17 cameras. It's got 10 or 11 instruments. It is an incredible machine which could conceivably last into the 22nd century. It could have easily driven from Warwith up to Sidonia. Well under 100 years, a few years. They didn't pick that. <coughs> Darn. You know, that's that old joke, good news, bad news joke. I won't go into it, it's very long. But it's funny, all right? Google is your friend. So they picked a place called Gale. What the heck is Gale? Why would one want to go to Gale? Well, as I started looking, I realized it was not far away from Spirit, where they landed Spirit, which is at the edge of one of the two ancient oceans that Mike and I wrote about in the title Mars paper on Enterprise. Again, Google title Mars paper, Enterprise Mission, and you'll find it. I recommend everybody read this background for what's coming. This is kind of where Gale is, and it's really weird because it's right on the edge, exactly on the edge of what's called the line of dichotomy. Mars basically has, like a lot of other places in the solar system, two hemispheres that are absolutely as different as night and day. It's got the heavily cratered southern hemisphere, and it's got a very flat, very sparsely cratered northern hemisphere, and the line between them is not like the equator, which would be like that, that would be parallel to the equator. It's tilted by 35 degrees. Or if you want to do the inverse, it's tilted by almost 60 degrees. And that should ring a bell, because 60 degrees is a major angle in the hyperdimensional torsion field physics model. We'll get into that tomorrow night. <clears throat> But how did Gale, the place they picked to land Curiosity, wind up exactly on this dichotomy line? I mean, the other thing that made Gale very weird was, look at all these craters. They have very flat floors. Here's a flat, there's a flat, there's a flat, there's a flat, there's, you know. Gale is not flat. Gale has a huge mountain. They call it a mound. I mean, why does NASA do things like that? Call it what it is. It's exciting. It's a mountain. It's, it's, it's five kilometers. That's 3.3. <clears throat> That's interesting. Miles high. 
This is a perspective shot down there among Ted's stars. This is Gale with the mound in the center. This is a closer artist view. A brilliant genius named Van Flute or Van der Flute in Amsterdam did this. This is Gale with this mound in the center, this mountain. This is where they decided to go. This is one of the reconstructions in their logic as to why they decided to go to Gale Crater. Because in their reconstruction of Mars history, which is billions and billions of years old, at one time when Mars was warmer and wetter and it rained and there were oceans and all this wonderful Earth-like stuff they keep telling us is totally in the past, never to be seen again, and billions of years in prehistory, Gale, they tell us, had water in it. It was a huge lake with this mountain almost like Crater Lake in Nevada, on the Nevada border with California, except Crater Lake is volcanic and there's no possibility that this crater on Mars was volcanic. It is 96 miles across. We'll say 100 for round numbers. In the middle of which there is this mountain, three miles plus high, which is in fact higher than the rim of mountains circling the crater, which under normal circumstances in the NASA model is formed by the splash of the impact. Cratering is a very interesting process. You can go online and you can see animations you know, of, of cratering on the moon and Mars and any other celestial body. Really exquisite 3D animations, movie quality, you know, Spielberg quality. So again, Google is your friend. How did this mountain, with a peak higher than the rim of the impact crater in which it is formed, form? That is the reason NASA says it has gone to Gale. To figure out the natural, and I underscore that word, natural processes that formed a crater and a mountain that's taller than the rim of the crater inside and whatever geological processes and evolution of fluvial and aerolian, which is air stuff, like volcanic ash falling on things, that formed this over, in their model again, billions and billions of years. This little footprint, this little rectangle, is the footprint of the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft camera. The high-resolution, high-rise camera looking down from something like 180 miles overhead uh, and taking wonderful, exquisite, high-resolution pictures, which they then mosaic into a model that they can create this 3D model in the computer that gives you a perspective shot. Even in this view, there's some kind of interesting geometry about the central mountain in Gale. Well, as I looked at these high-res shots, I suddenly realized and I went on coast and I told George one night, this is why they've gone to Gale and absolutely I agree now, it's better than Sidonia because whereas Sidonia is almost destroyed, under the best imagery you really can't see much of anything that's left there, the stuff in Gale appears to be in very good condition in places and we're going to get right up close and personal meaning we're going to wander around with a rover. This is the scale. This is 50 meters, that little bar. 50 meters is 150 feet. So you can see the scale of these very, very geometric constructions. Now, NASA claims these are what are called um, uh, fractures, uh, cemented fractures. They're claiming this is just natural geology. Yeah, right. The more you look, the more you're going to see. For instance, right over here, look at this little guy right here. Do you see these regular vertical lightnesses that are very regularly spaced? Those appear to be something that has a rhythm, something that has structure on an artificial geometry as opposed to a natural geometric model. So looking at this and other data I'm going to show you momentarily, like this, I realize suddenly 
that what NASA may have sent Curiosity to explore on almost live global television was nothing less than perhaps the most impressive artificial structure in the solar system. In other words, my thinking was this could be the surviving remnant of an ancient arcology. Hold that thought. On the northwestern side of Gale, this ellipse is the landing ellipse. This is the projected area in which they were going to put Curiosity down. Out in front of the mountain, which is down here. Notice what's coming down from the north rim. There's a valley here, which is called, as of a couple, three days ago, Peace Valley. Remember, Mars is the red planet, the planet of war. Most, if not all, of the names and nomenclature for Martian sites and Martian features and Martian things are drawn from mythology. You know, and they've tried to sprinkle it around so it isn't just Roman and Greek, it's now Indian, it's now Vedic, it's now Middle Amer Mesoamerica, and it's now Sumerian, it's even, you know, the, the, the Polynesian. They're trying to be very, you know, what's the word, Mike, you would be the one to first think of it? Politically correct? <laughs> Yes. See, Mike and I have kind of divergent political views on certain things. That's all we're going to say about that. But as soon as they did this, I thought, oh, bingo, this is interesting. This is a tell. Because why would you call a major feature, which may in fact have been how all the water came in from the ocean up north that flooded this crater floor and produced temporarily a lake, in which all kinds of interesting stuff happen because when you mix water, a lot of water and other stuff, what do you get? When the water dries out, you get sedimentation. You get fossilization. You get preservation. But why would you call this major river system, which produced what's called an alluvial fan, which simply means it's where all the junk that was eroded when the, when the valley was created by this rush of water which literally overflowed the northern rim. Can you imagine the planetary catastrophe required to flood a rim that's three miles high? Think of that scene in the movie 2012. That is what they're positing happened. Except they don't say the planet tipped over. No, they wouldn't say that. Yet, but that's what to, had to have happened if a wall of water cascaded across that northern rim, remember three miles high above the plain, the, 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 the datum, the kind of mean sea level of Mars, which is the plain outside the rim, and flooded down creating an alluvial fan which they call Peace Vallis, the Valley of Peace on the planet of war. Into this valley, this huge expanse of the crater floor, which has secrets, as you're about to see. So this is where they intend to put Curiosity down. These are now images. This is from MRO. This is an image which is black and white. In the center, there's a strip of color. It's canted to the north. North is up and down, so it's a few degrees off north because of the orbit. And when you look at the really high-res stuff, you can see that there's all kinds of stunning geometry of this crater floor. This is a photograph taken on Earth of an ancient ruin in Iran called the Sarvistian Castle. All right? This is obviously a ruin. But look at this stuff. This has been excavated. This has not been excavated. This is what artificial geometry looks like when you bury it under sands here on Earth and then fly over in the 1930s with an airplane and take pictures. The first efforts at serious aerial archaeology on Earth by means of airplanes were done in the Middle East. Gosh, I wonder why. Because you got some of the oldest stuff on Earth still buried under the sands and that's how they were looking for things to dig, to excavate, to understand. 
This is what it looks like. It doesn't look nice and sharp and pristine. It looks, except for this angle, which is pretty much 90 degrees, but even this is very ragged. So this is what you got to get your mind wrapped around. Ruins on other planets that are left by people a long, long, long time ago will not look like this. They will look like this, except for a shard or two that's still sticking up because there's been no excavation of anything out there for in our best estimate, millions, if not longer, years. So with that as background, you want to take a look at this. This is now a close-up of the floor of Gale Crater. And if you look very carefully, you'll see there's all kinds of rectilinear regularity, like there were ancient walls and structures built by, by intelligence on a rectilinear geometry underneath the sand. Can't quite see that. Okay, this is Armana in Egypt. This is excavated archaeology. This is unexcavated. Notice you've got sand, which still is, is a telltale clue on the surface, even if there has been no shovel work done, because it's very hard to pile enough dirt and sand on, on a structure to make it completely invisible to the right lighting and the right camera and the right satellite technique now. This is the future of archaeology on all planets. And it was started here on Earth in the 1930s, actually even before, with guys with Kodaks and brownies hanging out of you know, Ford trimotors, flying over the deserts looking for ancient ruins where they could land someday or bring in a camel train and put a spade in the earth and see what was down there. This now is a much better version. This stuff has been eroded out of the landscape by fluvial, by uh, aeolian processes, by the wind. Basically taking the muds, drying them out and blowing them away so you have the ruins left. This is also on the floor of Gale. Look at this stunning rectilinear arc. There's no doubt there are ruins on Mars. If I was to do what John Anthony West did some years ago, when he was testing his model that the Sphinx had been carved by water, he went up to Harvard and he took a picture and he cut off the top of the Sphinx so you just had what's called the Yardang, the body. And he showed it to a geologist and he said, is that water damage? And the geologist looked at it, you know, and he said, of course. Then he flipped up the card that was covering the head and the guy said, oh, I, 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 I have a meeting, I have to go. And he ran out of the office. Because the idea that the Sphinx on Earth has been carved by water damage would mean instantly that it's got to be a lot older than 5,000 years, and that's the taboo. That's the place that no one can go. Because civilization on Earth has got to be the canonical five or 6,000 years old. If the Sphinx was older, back to when there was a fluvial period in the Sahara Desert, which is minimum 10,000 years, then right away, everything we think we know about ancient civilizations on Earth is tossed into a, a cropped hat. Now, we've got a new discovery that Linda Moulton Howe has been reporting on very nicely on coast, a place called Gobekli Tepe, which is an astounding set of ruins in Turkey that's admitted now by the mainstream archaeologists to be 12,000 years old. It hasn't kind of made it yet to the front page of the New York Times that Sumer is now relegated to a totally different place in history. It's no longer the oldest civilization because the mathematics and sophistication embodied and coded in Gobekli Tepe is astonishing for a bunch of people that didn't apparently write anything down, but they left this incredible three-dimensional artwork on the pillars which look like zodiacal symbols and signs. There's something that's connecting Gobekli Tepe to the stars, to the sky. Oh, and after it was built 12,000 years ago, it was deliberately buried and only began to be excavated again by a German archaeologist in 1994. And something like 5% has now been revealed. 5%, that means 95% is still buried underneath. And it appears, to my mind, looking at this, to have been deliberately buried, which is what the mainstream guys also agree, but they don't understand why. And to me, it's obvious. It was deliberately buried because it's a time capsule. 
I discussed this in some of my Elenine presentations last year. And a time capsule, if you got the code, has to be uncovered, opened, at the right date. Well, what is it about Gobekli Tepe that connects to the heavens? Ultimately, I think we're going to find it might connect to Mars because the datings that you're going to see appear to be contemporaneous. If there was a previous high-tech civilization on this planet 12, 13,000 years ago, and they knew something really bad was going to happen, maybe they preserved something of themselves for the future. And we would reconstruct civilization, climb back up the stairway of technology, reach for the stars, understand the solar system and the incredible prehistory in which we are surrounded and put the pieces together so we can do something this time to save ourselves from what happened the last time. That's just a model, but it's not a bad model. And what we need to press everyone on is what have they found in Gobekli Tepe that would basically tell somebody what to do. Like you got this instruction book that says in case of fire, press this. In case of imminent planetary disaster, do this. When you care enough to leave the very best. As I have been saying about Sidonia for many, many years. So this is now, this is on the floor of Gale Crater. This unfortunately is not where Curiosity has landed. However, it's driving currently to a place that is kind of like this, as you're going to see. This is more earthly ruins. This is in Jordan. This is what stuff that's newly excavated looks like. It's not like New York City when you fly over it in a 737. It doesn't have crisp, clean lines. It's really a mess. But it's an organized mess, and it looks like this if it's still buried. And yes, this is where they plan to put curiosity. There's one other data point you've got to understand for context. And how are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, all right, my watch is a little slow. Anyway, this red stuff here is what's called a high thermal inertia unit. What the heck is that? If you take a satellite scan in the infrared of a Martian desert during the day and then take a similar scan during the night, you can do this on Earth too. I mean, this is actually where the technique was developed, obviously. If you have some surface which is hard, like rock or metals or buildings or a parking lot, you know, asphalt, whatever, and you have another surface nearby which is fluffy and dusty and sandy and very unconsolidated and made of lots and lots and lots of little tiny particles with basically zero mass and lots of cavities in between. There's a difference in the cooling rate between the high density stuff, the rock, the buildings, Los Angeles seen from orbit at night, let's say, and the dusty deserts outside of LA like the Mojave. And it all has to do with the ability to hold heat. Why are solar systems, thermal solar systems, that have things on the roof with pipes running through behind glass that stream hot water through glass so the sunlight keeps heating the water hotter and hotter, and then the pipes run through a huge room filled with rocks? Because the rocks will hold the heat. So during the night or during the winter, if you're in New England, or during several cloudy days, if you're in New England and it's even the spring or whatever, you use the heat stored in the rocks to keep the house warm, even when the sun isn't shining and your solar system isn't functioning because there's no sunlight to make it function. So it's a well-known principle that high-density materials, like rock or concrete or metals or whatever, will store heat well through several nights. That's what we're seeing. That's what they're seeing, what NASA's seeing on Mars. This map, which shows Peace Valley and the alluvial fan where water came rushing down, at the end of that fan with all that rushing water, that huge flood that came into this and filled the valley floor at some point, you have these areas which are very different. This is the key here. The red stuff, the, the darker the red stuff, the higher what's called the thermal inertia. The more heat that region 
holds at night on Mars. And the official guys say, oh, this is a mystery. We don't understand why. We've got to land. So we maybe, if we land right, remember, this is where they put the ellipse, so they can land the Curiosity somewhere in this ellipse and drive to the nearest thermal inertia anomaly and drill and measure and see on the ground with ground truth what differentiates the high thermal inertia areas from the other terrain they've landed on. And fortunately, and I am really wondering, if they landed here, actually they moved, you're going to see, they moved the landing ellipse just before landing, so it was a lot closer to the base of, of Mount Sharp, which is the name of the mountain in Gale Crater now, named after a guy that I met back during the Viking missions at JPL 30 plus years ago, 36 years ago, um, named Bob Sharp, a very interesting Caltech geologist. I have my own reasons for thinking they called it Mount Sharp, and it has nothing to do with Bob Sharp. It has to do with this. Look at the shape of this. Does it kind of look like this? I mean, I saw this and I thought, oh my god. Because as you know, if you've listened to me or watched any of the TV stuff I've done or listened to Coast or gone on Enterprise, we have an entire physics based on the circumscribed tetrahedral model. And like the Egyptians, who encoded their cosmology and their architecture, and we know this because they left us writing where they said, we're encoding our cosmology and our architecture. I believe firmly that the ancient Martians did exactly the same thing. They encoded their cosmology, the physics of how the universe works, in their major mega architecture. And since the hyperdimensional torsion field model is how the universe works, according to data I'm going to present tomorrow night, which is really pretty cool. You want to come and see this. This is, this is pioneering stuff. No one has seen this yet. This is the basis of our very exhaustive measurements of the solar eclipse in May, and a couple weeks later, the transit of Venus, and stunning results were gotten by all of us on the top of the Sandia Mountains, 12,000 feet above sea level, perched on 1,000 feet of limestone. Limestone is very important in this physics, as you will find out. If we're simply following the trail of the ancient Martians, as the data of Sidonia seems to indicate, then it seemed perfectly reasonable that if you're building something really, really huge, like an artificial structure the size of a mountain in a crater right on the edge, you, this is another ver version of the same geometry, well, other places on Mars. I forget exactly where this is. There's a black and white image taken by Surveyor and then a color image done by um, a friend of mine, um, Keith, Keith Laney, back east. And this is amazing because that's not a random shape. Let me show you what this shape is. It's called a Relu Triangle. It's based on the mathematical concept of the Vesica Pisces, which is one of the sacred architectural forms. Why is this architecture and geometry called sacred? Well, because it taps into the way the universe really functions. Hyperdimensional physics is exemplified by this kind of geometry. And isn't it interesting to find this kind of geometry on Mars in a building which is this size? And there's some really cool details here that I can't get into. Like over here, there's a perfect square, like a huge doorway looked at from the top down, because you're in orbit looking straight down with the MRO spacecraft. So what do we see next? If you put a Relu triangle in Gale Crater, it turns out that all the visible geometry fits perfectly inscribed in the Relu Triangle, and the initial place that they wanted to land Curiosity was exactly on the boundary between the crater floor and where the triangle, if this is a massive construct, began. Exactly. And what are the odds of that? Further, this is the reconstruction of the period when a lot of water I mean, this artist's conception is interesting because he shows a lot of water in the crater, but he doesn't show any water outside. Like, where did the water come from? It came over the rim of this ancient crater. We don't know when. 
Nobody knows how old this stuff is. My bet is that they won't be able to tell us because they don't carry the right instrumentation to do the fine radiometric measurements of radioisotopes that would give us ages. They will be able to give us relative ages if they tell us at all. There's always that problem with NASA. Will they tell us the truth? But they won't be able to give us absolute ages, which is why you've got to either send astronauts there or bring samples back so you can bring this stuff into the lab and actually do the radiometric analysis, the radiometric clocks here on Earth. This is where things get very interesting. If Gale, if Mount Sharp, if this huge thing in the center, this mountain, is in fact an ancient building, remember, a hundred miles across and three miles high. And if that sounds unbelievable, just wait. In the 1960s, in 1964, and Giorgio, you mentioned, that, I mean, it was eerie sitting wa watching Giorgio last night because the things that he was bringing up are the things that we have been working on quietly and never had a conversation and obviously two minds independently coming to some of the same conclusions. Nikolai Semenovich Kardashev was a student of one of the most brilliant Russian cosmologists and astrophysicists of all time, a guy named Shlovsky, who in 1966 did a book with Carl Sagan, which Carl proceeded to steal out from under him. That's a long story. But the upshot was it was called Intelligent Life in the Universe, and it brought Shlovsky's ideas for the first time to the West, to Western civilization, because there's been this real kind of snobbish, you know, anything invented in the East isn't really worthy of note by Western scientists and Western culture and CIA and all that. So Sagan did us a favor, and I think knowing Carl as I do and knowing that he was a double agent as I do, and that's a long discussion, I think he did it deliberately. I think he was able to kind of smuggle this brilliant genius's ideas out of the Soviet Union. Remember, the Soviet Union back then was the iron fist of Stalin keeping everything in check, even though he'd been dead since the 50s. It hadn't really changed much culturally, except in the sharing of scientific data among people in NASA and in the Russian space agency. That, that barrier was interestingly transparent, even at the height of the Cold War, which raises, in my mind, kind of intriguing questions, but we'll go on. So Shlovsky had a grad student who was as much a genius as he was. Uh, the important thing about the right professors is they inculcate in students. They pick out the really bright ones. They give them their head if it's done in the right cultural context. And then the student can be as equal to or sometimes outshine the grandfather professor. Shlovsky had another genius student named Kozarev, who you will hear about in great detail. He's in, in, in Mike's book at, at great length, uh, The Choice. Uh, do you have Kozarev at all in the new book? No, Mike's gone. But no. Oh, Mike left? Mike left? Oh. Oh, okay. That's a shame. Can we let Mike in? Somebody, please? Because if he asks me what I talked about, I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> and David will have to... Anyway. Yeah, I'll check it. Yeah, okay. Oh. Who left? Oh. Giorgio left? He's not going to be very happy. Huh. Anyway, so Shlovsky created the context for these genius protégés, one of whom was Kardashev. And I was very happy last night when, when uh, Giorgio properly credited Kardashev, not uh, Michio Kaku, with coming up with this idea. Because in 1964, Kardashev wrote this paper with this extraordinarily banal title, you know, Transmission of Information by Extraterrestrial Civilization. Well, in 64, that was kind of out there. I mean, it was really out there. But if you read the whole abstract, there isn't one single mention of the seminal idea in the paper, which was that when we look at the galaxy with radio telescope, this is a really stunning shot of a radio telescope facility in South America, this is our gorgeous Milky Way, 400 billion stars, that we are looking out on a potential progression of civilizations that literally would appear to ancient peoples 
And this is where I disagree with Giorgio. I think if those folks showed up tomorrow, there'd be a whole bunch of people worshiping them, starting with John Boehner. <laughs> because power absolutely bows down to more power. And this represents stunning power. Kardashev in the paper laid out that there were type 1, type 2, type 3, and possibly higher level civilizations. And each was marked in his paper by an increase in the amount of available energy they controlled. Type 1 was the ability to control energy of an entire planet. Type 2, an entire star system. Type 3, an entire galaxy. And when you get above type 3, you're literally, you know, dealing with, um, um, oh, what was, the, what was the, the civilization in Star Trek played by, um, you know the guy I mean. The Q. The Q. Yes. You know, you're, you're basically in the Q continuum up here. And unlike Kardashev, who of course was using only available energy as the determinative of this type 1, type 2, type 3, once you get above type 1, the way you get there is by tapping into torsion field hyperdimensional physics. So basically anything beyond a type 1 and you're at the level of God. Because that physics allows you to create, manipulate, cr manufacture, alter, and destroy matter and energy at will. To literally reform reality. And on that basis, all these higher levels kind of blend and blur, and you can go from a type 1 to a type 3 overnight. In other words, you can go from mindless primitives, to quote Forbidden Planet, who are killing each other with stone knives and bearskins, quoting Spock from Star Trek, <laughs> to the ability to wield the energy and the capabilities of gods, but with the minds and the, and the, and the fears and the hauntings and the incredible primitive atavistic inclinations of people who are no better than those wearing stone knives and, or, or using stone knives and wearing bearskins in the twinkling of an eye. And that, I think, is going to be the ultimate limit of civilizations. Because if you give, I mean, people make a big deal out of nuclear energy. Can you imagine the ability to, to explode and destroy entire planets at the flick of a switch? That's what we're dealing with. That's what Joseph Farrell and I have been talking about in terms of the potential of this physics. And that's why measuring its reality, as we did and you're going to see tomorrow night, is crucial to the future of this civilization. Because we're just one slight step above stone knives and bearskins. I mean, just look at CNN. Look at the insanity going on around this planet. And imagine those um, terrorists, not with nukes, but terrorists with HD physics, and you wind up destroying the planet. Because all it takes is one madman with the right technology, and it's, it's all over. And ultimately, that physics is so democratizable that it can be all over, unless you build in safeguards. The good news about HD physics is the same physics that can destroy can prevent destruction, provided you've got the right infrastructure in place set up to do that. With the right HD torsion field technology, you can literally make it so a nuclear weapon cannot explode. And as you're going to see tomorrow night, that physics is real, which means the technology is real. Because the, the, both sides in this race have had 60-some years of reinventing this technology going back to World War II, which we'll get into a bit tomorrow night. Anyway, so Kardashev talked about this progression of civilization. Well, where is ancient Mars on this scale? I put it, based on the best data that I've been able to assemble, just below a Type II, able to control the energies of an entire star system, meaning this solar system. Why do I say that? Because when you look at the artist's conceptions and the projections and the models of what a Type II would be able to do, it would be able to literally create artificial planets. Well, lo and behold, as we looked at the NASA data, 
we have found places, let's look for all the world in this solar system. Remember, Kardashev was projecting to the galaxy because back then they were all virgins. They hadn't a clue that we had stunning artificial stuff right next door in our neighborhood. So if you look in our neighborhood, one of the places we've looked very carefully is this exquisite place. And I did a presentation in England a couple of years ago, which I'm going to bring to the U.S. and I'll do a proper version so you don't have to watch that grainy, you know, out of focus YouTube video, which a lot of people come up and tell me, oh my God, you got to hear this so I can see it. Yes, I've been holding off because it's not time yet. It's getting close to time. We actually may do some of that on the ship when we're, you know, in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, in the middle of the night, heading toward the Yucatan to measure this physics and what the ancients left us there at uh, Chichen Itza. I may actually do some of that because you'll need context to appreciate what we're going to find when we get to Chichen Itza the following dawn. Orbiting Saturn, there is a place. This place. It's called Iapetus. It's the place where Arthur Clarke actually placed 2001, which in the movie got changed to Jupiter. But it really was Saturn and it really was this bizarre, extraordinary, exotic, amazing moon called Iapetus. Why is Iapetus amazing? Not only does it have a brilliant half and a pitch black half, literally the difference in brightness between coal, coal dust, which reflects what, 1%, 2%, and blinding snow on two hemispheres. And it orbits Saturn in 80 days, 79 and change, so that it appears on a telescope from Earth when it's on this side, it's brilliantly reflective. And when it's on this side, it's absolutely almost invisible. So it appears to be a winking moon. You see it, you don't. You see it, you don't. And Cassini was the guy who found it, and he and others coming after him in the 1700s were perplexed. What would cause a body in the solar system to appear to wink out as it orbited its parent planet. Well, now we know it's because it has a bright half and a dark half. And that's why Arthur, among other reasons, I think, placed the centerpiece of 2001 in the mystery of the winking moon of Iapetus. Well, when the Cassini mission flew by in around Christmas of 2004, it found that girdling the moon, there is this stunning ridge, which is 60,000 feet high, 60,000 feet, arrow straight, encompassing, at that time they thought it only encompassed most of the dark hemisphere. Now from all the other photography that's come in from Cassini, I can tell you that this thing girdles the entire moon. It's like a walnut with a ridge that you put two halves together, or that little gadget that Giorgio handed out last night, the clown nose, the plastic case with the ring around it. That's what Iapetus is. In our model, which I will buttress with actual additional data someday, there's a whole five or six uh, segment thing on Enterprise on Iapetus called Moon with a View. Iapetus is a type two artificial world constructed by the ancient, extraordinary ancestors of the human species which lived in the solar system a long, long time ago, millions of years ago, and were destroyed by their own physics and technology. And we are their descendants, crawling up almost out of the slime, trying to reconstruct the power of the gods, which now, unfortunately, is in the hands of some black ops people who are not totally sane. And I'm not talking about Al-Qaeda. The other guys are equally out to lunch. And they have power because the ability to use this, to wield this physics and technology, for most of the culture is still being kept in secret. The one place where it became visible briefly, which totally changed the course of current civilization, was on 9-11. That's what brought down the towers and maybe impacted the Pentagon. Not nanothermite, not inside bushies, none of the truther excuses come up to the real physics. The reality of what happened on 9-11 is to be found in the work of Dr. Judy Wood, 
read her book, Where Do the Towers Go? The only missing puzzle piece in Judy's exquisite reconstruction of the material science and paper trail of the evidence behind 9-11 is the actual science of what did it. She talks about energy weapons. We know the kind of energy weapons that were used. They were the same energy and energy weapons that were used to destroy an entire planet. 65 million years ago in the solar system, leaving the ruins, the burned out hollow ruins of an extraordinary, magnificent civilization that once lived here, which are our great, 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 great ancestors. And we now are on a path for a decision. Will the secret ops guys use the same technology to destroy this civilization? on a much smaller scale, because we're not out there yet? Or will we democratize it, bring it into the open, put proper controls on it, because you can't keep secrets if everybody knows what's possible. And as I say, the same technology in physics which can destroy, can create, can prevent the destruction, if you understand what you're dealing with. At the moment, nobody knows what is out there because nobody admits to, in fact, what we are heritage to. We have more examples. We have this place. Here's a Galileo shot of Earth and Moon. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'm not doing too bad. We have this extraordinary natural satellite called Luna. As Mike has said in his presentations, in fact he gave one this morning, he's going to give another one tomorrow morning, I've been working for many, many years to understand what's on these images, on the NASA data, on the Japanese data, the Russian data, the Indian data of what's really on the moon. And I've come to the conclusion that even looking at the primitive Apollo photographs, if you simply brighten up, just turn up the gain on these stunning Hasselblad images, all this incredible geometry is all over the sky. This used to be ruin, this used to be buildings miles high above the surface of the moon in extraordinary complex geometries. Here's a stunning tower. Can you imagine these things fleshed out with glass and power and light at night? The moon glistened like a jewel and it was destroyed in a heartbeat by the explosion of the fourth planet from the sun, not Mars at that time, according to Tom Van Plandern, my late friend Tom Van Plandern, and my reconstructions, Mars was a satellite orbiting Mars. And when this planet that it orbited was destroyed, the gravitational field, of course, went away, and Mars was released into the most elliptical orbit of any planet in the inner solar system, still orbiting the sun. And half of it was destroyed, and the other half protected by being on the on the anti-blast side. And that's why we see the aspherical, asymmetrical dichotomy with Gale exactly on the boundary in between. I don't know yet what that means. It means something, because it can't it just happen by chance. They picked the one crater with the mountain that was sitting right on that line of dichotomy. That line of dichotomy is the key to the secret war 65 million years ago that destroyed an entire world. And the shrapnel, when you blow up an entire planet and reduce it to the kind of dust that we saw those buildings reduced to in the World Trade Towers, except you know, flying outwards at miles per second as a cloud of intense, deadly shrapnel, the mass of an entire world reduced to almost micron-sized grains, the sandblasting effect, the destructive effect of this sleet storm through the solar system, unstoppable by any technology, even a Type 2. Because how do you stop it? It's like trying to, you know, shoot with a, with a, with a shotgun a swarm of mosquitoes swarming around a lamppost. You know, you'll get a few, but most of them you won't. And then they'll get mad. So the moon contains this stunning ancient echo. Now, how do we know that we're not just projecting on, you know, weird patterns on photographs? Because in 2009, when the LaCrosse mission from NASA 
uh, flew by the moon in preparation for the impact of the uh, Centaur rocket, which was going to land hard at 5,000 miles an hour at the South Pole, kick up a cloud of dust, and they were going to measure by spectroscope the contents, the, 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 the uh, materials in the plume. In June of 2009, when they swung around the moon prior to their impact months later, they took a series of infrared shots of the far side of the moon. This is, this is crucial. If you don't understand this, then, then Google is your friend. You can, you can go back and look at this in detail on Google. This is an infrared shot of the night side of the moon. This is the sun side. The thermal map goes from the highest temperature, which is like 250 degrees above zero, broiling sun, high noon on the moon, the sun is coming in like this, is on this hemisphere. As you get to the dark side, the night side, the literal dark side, which the moon rotates every month, so it has two weeks of light and two weeks of dark, the temperature nicely falls. Yellow is cooler than red, green is cooler than yellow, blue is cooler than green, and this stuff down here, as you can see, is the temperature of outer space. It's like just a few degrees of absolute zero, you know, in the, in the thermal detectivity of the sensor in the spacecraft. Except at the edge of the moon, there's this weird colored boundary. It's like it doesn't go red all the way up to the edge. It changes color to yellow and then blue and then goes to the background of outer space. That is not an artifact of the detector. That is real data. What that is telling us is there's something material arching over this entire expanse of the far side of the moon, which is absorbing sunlight, warming up, and re-radiating that thermal energy to be picked up by the lacrosse instrument infrared camera. In other words, that is the infrared signature of the huge meteor shields that Mike talked about per our model on coast the other night, arching tens of miles above the moon on the far side, which was the side that was facing away from the explosion, which is why they're far more visible with the right instrumentation on the far side than they are on the near side. The scale of mega engineering required to do that is only possible for a Kardashevian type two, roughly, civilization. The ability to control the energy and resources of an entire solar system and either build artificial worlds or remake the natural ones. Because the moon, I agree with Giorgio as he said yesterday, the moon is not hollow. You know, when it rang like a bell, it didn't ring like a bell because it's hollow, it rang like a bell because the structures on the moon, when you, when you hit them, like an old trestle, like a railway trestle, or, 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 or a, um, a carnival ride, or a, um, a roller coaster trestle. When we were kids, we used to have, we had a train running a mile or so behind our house, and we would go off into the swimming hole was underneath the train bridge, and one of the fun things we used to do was to listen on the tracks for where a train was coming. And when the train got to the bridge, we would all jump off, and you know, wave at the engineer, who of course was pale as a sheet, because he envisioned obviously someday he was going to kill a lot of kids. <laughs> but then we would run back up and we would listen to the trestle, and you could hear it swaying and creaking and groaning even 15 minutes after the train had left. The vibrations of the trestle were still audible, even just pressing your ear to the trestle. That's what Apollo recorded in the seismometry data. When they say the moon rang like a bell after the lunar module impacted, it rang like a bell because the trestle structure of these miles of glass cascading trestle-like domes and meteor shields, there's still enough of it left there that it rings, it communicates sound waves, seismic energy, and that's what's swaying back and forth and ringing in the Apollo seismic data. We published this back in the 1990s in Planetary Horizons, so it's a very old model and someday we will have total confirmation if we can get access to independent seismic records. Which brings us back to Mars. We know at Sidonia that there's this incredible math laid out in the structures here. Well, that math 
is in fact nothing less than the fundamental mathematics underlying the hyperdimensional torsion field model. And if that's to have me stop at 6, if we got such a late start because the room wasn't ready, I'm going to go to 6.30. Thank you. Does anybody <clears throat> on a Saturday night have any other place to go? <laughs> and you pay good money to see this, and you're going to see the whole thing. Anyway, so this data is coded in the geometry of Sidonia. The physics of how to rebuild solar systems, how to become a type 2 civilization, is laid out in the monuments of Mars. And if it's laid out, as it is, it leads to all kinds of further implications about how matter operates at the atomic level, the kind of geometry of the beams of spinning systems of stars or machines that are using this technology. There's more to it than merely the control of energy, because remember, since we now understand that this physics is hyperdimensional, in other words, it's not even just taking the energy of the sun and controlling it for use in three dimensions. It's taking access to the infinite amount of energy that's available in hyperspace. There's this exquisite scene in Forbidden Planet when, you know, Walter Pidgeon, who plays, you know, uh, Forbius, and his wife, played by this very cool actress that I unfortunately never got to meet while she was alive, they're in the Krell laboratory, and the Krell are burning through the doors made of Krell metal, 20-some inches thick. And Morbius can't acknowledge that it's his own hyperdimensional self, his monster from the id, which is controlling this phantom being and bringing to bear as much energy as is available from hyperspace, which is infinite, to burn down that door and reach them. And the power meters of the Krell, which in this model are the ancient Martians, I've always said that, that this was a cautionary tale in 1956 about what human beings in their flawed and atavistic nature would do with access to this kind of science and technology. Pigeon says at one point that these dials are arrayed so that each one registers 10 times the power of the next and they're lighting up more and more of them as the Krell you know, phantom being created by the consciousness of Pigeon in his Dr. Morbius um, persona commands it to reach them and destroy them. And he looks at these gauges and he says, look at that, 10 times 10 times 10 to the power of infinity. That is the amount of energy available to this ancient type 2 solar system civilization. The amount of energy infinitely available, not from the sun, not from our star, not from nuclear physics, but from the fabric of hyperspace itself that allowed this civilization to literally remake Mars into an Earth-like world. This is an, an artist concept that I borrowed from Arthur, one of Arthur's books, of Mars back when it had oceans and, and rain and spring and flowers and all kinds of, of beings down there as part of a remake of the entire visible solar system, which now all we can see are faded, dusty, ancient, dead ruins in the wake of the interplanetary war, which Mars Science Laboratory is supposed to, I believe, secretly understand at Gale not on our behalf, not on behalf of the American taxpayer, not on behalf of the world, not on behalf of those watching the JPL press conferences, not us who merely paid for it, but for the secret cabal who have been running not just the NASA program, but all the space programs of all the countries of the world since the dawn of the space age. Which, of course, is why it is exquisite irony that in public, they have named that winding river valley, that ancient dried up river valley, entering Gale, Peace Valley. You cannot say they don't have a sense of irony. So here are the footprints of the landing. We're finally getting to the good stuff. Here are the footprints of the landing of the various missions we've sent to Mars as our technology 
the open source technology, the technology the public is supposed to know about, not the secret space program. That's a totally separate cutoff area. I have no doubt the secret space program guys have been here and know exactly what they're dealing with, and that's the playbook which NASA, the public side of NASA that we see, is running from. They knew what's there, and it only could be opened up in this magical year of 2012. Because remember, ritual drives everything in their minds, and the end of the Bakhtun, the end of the Mayan calendar, the beginning of the next cycle, the end of that 26,000 year progression processional cycle is the determinative in when the open source program can go. And it's now an open question to me whether we're ever going to get to see what they have found officially. Unofficially, as you're about to see, there has already been some stunning data leaked that leave, and you're going you're gonna to see it, will leave no doubt in your minds when you walk out of this room in 45 minutes that in fact this model is correct. In which case you will then have an incumbent responsibility to do something about what you have seen. And I have a couple of ideas for what that will be which I will lay out tomorrow night. So here we have the footprint of the Viking mission, the Pathfinder mission, the Spirit and Opportunity missions, that's MER, Mars Exploration Rover was their name, the Phoenix mission which landed near one of the poles, and finally, MSL. Notice only the entry technology of MSL is capable of landing with the precision required to get to the goodies in Gale. This is a perspective of the size of Curiosity compared to the initial little Sojourner rover, which is about the size of a microwave oven that went to Mars in 1997. This is the Spirit and Opportunity little, you know, golf cart size. This is Robert Bavol's, you know, terrifying vehicle that I drove around in uh, London in. This is the size of Curiosity. Actually, it kind of looks like, remember that great movie called Short Circuit? It looks like, you know, him. Yeah. That's not accidental. I think there's something going on. Anyway, they were initially supposed to land here. Just before they landed, they changed the footprint to here. Notice how much closer it is to this stuff which is where they're ultimately going. This is Gale. This is the Mount Sharp in the middle of Gale. This is the rim of Gale Crater, the south rim back there. That's the tip of the tetrahedron, way up there, tippy top. The good stuff they're driving to is right over here. They landed literally 400 meters from the good stuff. And this was, if you had been in space the night of August 5th, August 6th in, in the Eastern time zones, August 5th for the coast audience based in California. I did four hours with George that night with some guests that I selected as co-host to basically narrate the landing of Curiosity on Mars live. This is what you would have seen just before the entry sequence on the night of August 5th. Here is what NASA has called its seven minutes of terror. Don't you love how they kind of preloaded the psychology of this? This is the most astonishing opening to the revelation of our true history, who we really are, and they outline it, seven minutes of terror. That is psychological conditioning. That's not accidental. That's all part of a PSYOPs program. In fact, the problem is that this entry and, and landing had never been done. So we'll go through it very quickly. This is the separation of the um, uh, cruise stage, which had the solar panels, which occurred as this thing was approaching. This is the spacecraft all cocooned up in its heat shield and back shell, approaching Mars at something like 13,000 miles per hour. Entry from interplanetary space to Earth is 25,000, so it's somewhat lower, but still, without the proper heat shield, you won't survive. Now, this is the secret to how they were able to guide it to that pinpoint land. They landed as close to their designated landing spot on Mars after a journey of 190 some million miles or halfway around the sun, nine months, because they had what's called a controlled entry, little gas jets firing and rolling the spacecraft. They borrowed this technique directly from the Apollo program 40 years ago, which the astronauts used to land within like a mile and a half of the carrier. NASA landed Curiosity with a mile and a half of exactly where they wanted to. 
So that ellipse, that even small ellipse you saw, that was much bigger than where they actually set down. Here now is after the entry, the fiery entry with thousands of degrees plasma on the front on the heat shield. They're approaching Gale Crater. Look at the geometry of Mount Sharp in the middle of Gale. This is an official NASA simulation. If this thing is what I believe it is, an ancient, ancient fossilized arcology on Mars, potentially more than 65 million years old, imagine if this is merely a shell under dust that rained down from volcanoes triggered by the war, by the explosion of, the, of Planet 5, Planet 4. Imagine what could still be inside, in rooms the size of cities waiting to be explored by Curiosity. Oh, did I happen to mention that Curiosity carries headlights and nuclear power, which means you can go inside in the dark where the sun never shines. So this now is the parachute popping. They're heading down to the landing site. This is now a perspective view. They landed just before sunset at 3.30 local Mars time. 33? They're so cute. Oh, and people wondered why they landed and the last few minutes would, if it hadn't been for the satellites relaying data to Earth, they literally landed on the side of Mars that was just below the horizon as seen from the Earth. What NASA space agency in their right mind is going to land their most complex, expensive $2.5 billion spacecraft on the side of the planet that cannot be seen if the relay satellites poop out that would be totally invisible. Why was it? I didn't have the slide to put in, but I will tell you why. Because at this exact moment, if you were standing on the roof of the White House looking toward the western horizon, Mars was exactly 19.5 degrees above the horizon. Actually, 19.47. Ritual, ritual, ritual. And you can't have all these variables come out even. In other words, if you, if you want that as your primary objective, you have to be satisfied that Mar it's going to land when you can't see it from the Earth. That's why having the satellites in place, Odyssey and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and also Mars Express, was crucial to relay or record data from the landing. So why wouldn't you, after spending all this money, make it so it landed in the, in, in, on, on, the night, on, the, on the day side so you can see it? The only reason was the ritual. Mars had to be at 19.47 over the horizon. Here's the separation of the heat shield. There's actually stunning video, Google uh, Mardi uh, entry video, M-A-R-D-I. You'll find all kinds of YouTube versions. You'll find an ultra high resolution HD version showing the heat shield falling away and the spacecraft falling down toward the landing site, which is roughly, let me see if I can see where it is. It's, it's up over here, all right? It's just out of frame. And I won't take the time to show the movie. In fact, uh, this little tongue, the landing site is right here. All right? And the heat shield, they follow the heat shield all the way down, and there's actual video of the heat shield going splat in the sands of Mars. You can see the shadow rushing in and the heat shield meeting it, and then the sand gushing out as it hits. Of course, we didn't get this live. This is now, it's on the parachutes. Notice the color, the multiple color. There's a white top and there's an orange skirt. This is a simulation. This is not. This is an actual MRO image of the entry of Mars from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of Curiosity in the back shell with the heat shield missing on the parachute vertically descending toward the floor of Gale. And the amount of precision required to sink two spacecraft so that you are aiming the soda straw size field of view at the right time, at the right place, astonishing. And they did it. Then back to computer simulation. This is now the separation of the back shell. This is Curiosity, all scrunched up. The wheels are all folded up. This is the descent engine module. This is the actual uh, device which lights up its engines, and now you're on rocket thrust as part of those seven minutes of terror, falling at several hundred miles an hour toward the surface with only those engines to slow the fall and to precisely set it down in the right position. And then 
this amazing invention called the sky crane came into being, where they lowered Curiosity on nylon tethers with the wheels extended and the, and the engines blasting down very far, about 40 feet above so that the blast would not do much damage to the surface. Well, as you will see in a little while, that didn't quite work out as planned, but it did work out. It worked out. Then we have touchdown. Computer knows it's touchdown because it's no longer moving. It cuts the tethers with little guillotine knives, part of the 76 pyros that all had to function perfectly. And the sky crane uh, and, and descent stage flies away. And all hell broke loose at JPL. Look at this guy. Here's a sober engineer. This guy's probably not been as excited since the Trojans won. I mean, he is, look at him. And they're happy and clapping. And I, I took out all the sides I had showing them in tears and all this. I mean, these are, these are the honest side of NASA. These are not the guys that are keeping stuff from us. These are the honest guys. That stuff is being kept from them. So I'm hoping that some of them will see this presentation and realize what a stunning miracle they have accomplished because they have now put a spacecraft with the right kind of instrumentation in the middle of the ruins of a stunning Type II ancient civilization which is all around the rover as it landed just before sunrise, just at the edges of Mount Sharp. First thing they did, this, by the way, now is a circle showing, you know, their best estimate of where they were going to land compared to actually where they landed. Look at, look at, this is where some of the ballast fell. That's a photograph showing the ballast impacts. Look at how close we are, all right? But the real important stuff for the next few weeks is lying in this direction, as you're going to see. This was a photograph that was taken, an image, taken a few seconds after landing. And this, they made a big deal of this on the internet. Of course they did. Because look at this thing. Oh, what's this? Oh. You know, well, it turned out to be a very interesting known anomaly. This is a better version of it, all right? This, by the way, is a wide-angle camera, which is why the horizon appears very, very curved. This was taken to basically confirm they had touchdown and the spacecraft was intact. So what is this thing? Well, after a few days, they realized that what they were able to capture in the first few seconds after landing was the impact of that rocket-powered descent stage, which was programmed to fly off in a northwest direction and crash about 2,500 feet away, about half a mile away. And an image taken later showed the same horizon with no clouds. So they thought they might get this. They did. I mean, the engineering that goes into this is astonishing. This now is the first photograph taken with the hazard cameras looking in the other direction. They landed so they were actually facing Mount Sharp, and I'm still looking at that and saying, what are the odds, all right? And if you look very carefully at the base of Mount Sharp, here's what we see. There's all kinds of interesting structural detail. Go out, do this test. Go out here, you know, Southern California, you're not far away from, you know, the mountains, you know, 20, 30 miles away. Go up on those mountains and take some pictures with your, you know, camera, with, you know, wh whatever you got, digital camera. Bring them back, put them into Photoshop, make them the same scale, and see if you see this kind of structure on those mountains. What's interesting is that as we started looking at panoramas around this I mean, this is such an amazing place visually. It's the most amazing place we've ever seen from spacecraft surface imagery on Mars. In fact, it's so amazing that the project scientist for the Curiosity mission, a guy named John Grotzinger from Caltech, has been making some very curious statements comparing this scene to the Mojave Desert. In fact, he was doing it in such a way that one wonders. He also talked about how the first mission to Mars that he worked on, which was the Spirit mission, he frankly wondered if NASA had faked the data. I, when I heard him during the press conference say this, I'm wondering what in the world is going through his mind? Why would a project scientist even bring up the idea 
of NASA faking data? And the best answer I can come up with, based on, again, the imagery I'm going to show you, is that there are two sides of this mission. There's the side that they want us to see. Then there's the side that's really going on. And what Grotzinger and a number of other officials connected with the project are doing is speaking in code, kind of like Captain Booker back in 1968 when the North Koreans captured the Pueblo. And remember how the North Koreans marched out the, the uh, sailors on this spy ship that had been captured in North Korea's waters and forced them to confess and forced them to admit to all kinds of international high treason and breaking international law and all that. And what Booker had his people do during the video of that press conference, he had them with their eyelids blinking Morse code, saying, this is all bullshit. This is all bullshit. So it's an honored tradition if you're under duress to try to tell your prospective audience that what you're seeing is not exactly what you think you're seeing. And I believe that there are people associated with this project, with curiosity, with this mission, given what they know is there and what they are looking at when they're not showing us stuff, that in fact are telling us this is not exactly what is going on. For instance, on this panorama, I'll use this one because I don't think the stars are helping any, uh, way over here, there's an object that never got discussed at the press conference. This is now a major panorama showing that little portion with this little notch cut out. This is the base of Mount Sharp. Notice how we don't see the whole thing in high resolution? Why not? Why couldn't they have taken that? Why couldn't they have told the computer, if you land so-and-so, rotate the camera X number of degrees and take that picture? They didn't for some reason. I think it's because they wanted to see what they were going to see with themselves before they showed anybody else. Anyway, they didn't show us this. This is from the hazard camera, which they had to give us live so that we would see something in terms of it landing. So way over at the corner of that panorama, look at those stunning mountains. We have this little thing. I say little, but it's not. What's it look like? It looks like a pyramid, a huge, whomping ass pyramid on Mars, about the size of the Great Pyramid mm -hmm. on Earth. It's seven miles away from the camera. It would take them a few months to get there at the rate they've been going. Why haven't they gone there? Well, because I don't think it's in the allowed mission plan yet. I did some things with this. I made a comparison between one of the pyramids in Egypt at the same lighting and this. Notice there are several structures. Remember, if we're dealing with an ancient high-tech culture, it's very old and very eroded and not in very good shape. So what you're going to see in certain lighting is kind of like an echo of what it used to be. If you get up close, it's going to look a bit different because the farther back you stand, it's kind of like that line from Gigi, have I been standing up too close or back too far? <laughs> Sometimes you can see better standing back because you see the big picture. And when you get up too close, I mean, if you look at the Mona Lisa from too close, all you're going to see are brush strokes. And how could you ever tell from brush strokes that somebody actually had created the Mona Lisa? A few days after the landing, we finally got our first color panorama from the what's called the 34 millimeter mass cam. Again, notice that the top of Mount Sharp is interestingly missing. But over here is something. This is a thumbnail panorama. They would send down images in thumbnail form, and then they would send down the high res images. This is what the pyramid looks like on the thumbnail. Pretty. I mean, you can't tell anything. So what I did is I put the color to the black and white, like so, and now you can see what it looks like in color. Same accurate color data mapped on the black and white high-res version with these stunning mountains of the rim behind. With interesting geometry in the foreground. Remember, you're looking across seven miles 
of Martian desert on the floor of Gale. This is the geometry. The landing site is here. There's the pyramid. This is where they're eventually going up through this canyon and winding up to get the sample of the stratigraphy of all the stuff that has basically stacked up to create this mountain, which they are assuming is a natural feature. And I'm telling you it's a, an ancient fossilized arcology with a lot of stuff that fell on top during the catastrophe, during the aftermath of the catastrophic destruction of planet four. And we'll find out in the next several years who's ultimately right. But their first drive turned out not to be toward the mountain. Here again is a perspective view. They're here. There's the pyramid. They drove after about two weeks in this direction to reach a place on the floor which you can actually see in the overhead shots from the spacecraft as the heat shield was dropped away and the Marty camera was unveiled so that it could take descending photographs of the surface and put them into a movie. If you look at the base of Mount Sharp, which is what this stunning set of images shows us, you see all kinds of, again, regular geometry. And regular geometry is the hallmark, as Carl Sagan told us many, 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 many years ago, of an ancient culture, regardless of what planet you find it on. If you find regular geometry, yes, Robin? Okay. If you find ancient geometry, you found civilization. Here's an example. This is a city called Hamadan in Iran, which isn't ancient, it's kind of modern. Seen in perspective, look at, look at the way the architecture is all connected. This has to do with culture. They're not separate building units. They're actually contiguous rows, like row houses, like apartments. This is a close-up of the center of the base of Mount Sharp. Identical rectilinear geometry. In other words, these ruins at the base of Mount Sharp in our model are the exposed edges of the arcology which Mount Sharp used to be. Here's another interesting structure that no one has commented on. This sits right behind this, this moat, which you'll see in the wide angle in a minute. Look at the very interesting interior notches and regularity and geometry. One, two, three, four. This isn't natural geology. Geology doesn't do this. This is where it sits. This is this structure here. This is what I call the moat. Notice you've got sand dunes out here. The landing took place in this direction, a few miles away. All of this appears to be exposed ancient structure. We're going to focus on this area. Again, look for rectilinearity. Don't think New York City. Think the ancient buried ruins in Iran photographed from an old Ford trimotor in the 1930s. Look again at the regular geometry of eroded buildings. Look for symmetries. Look for patterns. Look for things like this. This is again Hamadan. Notice this symmetry in the sculpted out areas and the neat little geometries. And then you compare it to the same thing visible here Again, eroded by age, immense age. And now this is your overview showing where some of these color mosaics were taken, showing where the landing is, showing the whole front of Mount Sharp, showing the floor of Gale. This now is the crux of where we're going. Because we landed here, MSL is Mars Science Laboratory. They're headed for a region here where three geological units converge. This is where the so-called high thermal inertia terrain is located. But before they left the landing site, they did something very telling and very interesting. They named the landing site after Ray Bradbury and his stunningly provocative and preemptively predictive book, novel, called The Martian Chronicles. They call this Bradbury Landing. Ray is now immortalized on Mars. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to tell you, show you why that is, I think, a crucial detail. So the plan now was to drive from here 
In this direction where these three units, this is the high thermal inertia unit, this is another unit, and here's a third, they landed on this stuff. If you look carefully, you can actually see that there is stuff buried just beneath the sands. Here's a high res color image panorama, and you can now see some of the scour marks caused by the rockets as they descended. In the distance, you can see various scarps in the what they call the Glen Elg region, which is what I think the high thermal inertia is. It's the area beneath this cover exposing whatever is there, which as you're going to see in a minute is pretty interesting stuff, and here are the mountains beyond. Well, there are surprises out there, because if you look very carefully, right about there, there's something that shouldn't be. This is a wide angle view now. Look at the size of those mountains. Remember, three miles high. Look at this thingy. What's this? That is not a rock. That is not a piece of geology. That is like nothing that should be on Mars at all. It looks, in fact, like a modern millionaire's desert home out in the Mojave Desert. It's got symmetry, it's got details, it's got a double roof, it's got, look at the curve up here, look at, in other words, and it's sitting on a platform with regular pilings above other layers. That was my first indication that this region, in fact, might have buried treasure underneath the sand. Because if that was still surviving above ground, what in fact out in front of, Bre these by the way are the two rocket thruster areas, that's actual curiosity right there. And this is Bradbury Landing. Now why am I going to show you this? Because a lot of people don't know what mechanical high-tech ruins look like when seen on digital imagery. The wreck of the Titanic on the floor of the ocean is very illustrative. Because what do you have? You have an abyssal plain, meaning lots and lots of sediments with very few, if any, rocks. All this stuff is what happened when she sank and broke up, swirling down with the... Remember, she was falling at several, almost 100 miles an hour through two miles of ocean. And the water was ripping away pieces of her and shredding steel and mangled decking and ruins were falling out like cylindrical things. So what you see in the remains taken by underwater submersible photography and sonar imagery, which is what this is, is the mangled metallic debris of the most modern high-tech construct the human race had constructed in 1912, the Titanic. If there are the remains of an ancient high-tech civilization under Bradbury Landing, that's what it will look like. Bits and pieces excavated from the sands by the wind after being buried in that flood out on this vast plain in front of Mount Sharp, the three-mile-high mountain in the middle of the crater and it will not look like a rock. So as the sky crane lowered Curiosity and these rockets impinged on the surface, they dug areas out of the overburden. They literally blasted the sand and dust aside and left material underneath exposed, like here. This is called a scour. I think it's called Blackburn scour, if I'm not mistaken. And they focused in on this. This is a, a Burnside scour, I'm sorry. And the other one is called Glauburn scour, scour here. They, back, by the way, didn't drive over to Burnside, which is interesting, as you'll see. They, when they moved the rover, finally, they drove over to Goldburn, did some sampling, and then drove away. So what is in the scour that they didn't measure? Well, this. What's this? Why does it look like a piece of metallic stuff? Why does it have a wire coming out of it? And what's that thing next to it with a little hole right in the center? And what is this thing? 
with straight edges and the reddish stuff inside. In other words, are these rocks or are they rocks mixed together with other interesting debris? Leaving that aside, here's Burnside. Right next to it is this thing. This is astonishing. The closer you get, the more obvious it is. This is not a rock. This is a pump. It's got flanges. It's got vortice, a, a, a hole, an orifice. It's got wires. It's got axle symmetry. And oh, it's metallic. You know, it's a piece of junk. It's an artifact of a high-tech civilization, I think, ex uh, you know, excavated by the thrust of the rockets that blew away the surrounding dust. There's a hint of some more stuff back here, kind of in the wind shadow. I had Steve Troy do a comparison. This is an artist overlay, just so you can see the geometry. Rocks do not have cylindrical orifice sticking out of them. I guarantee you. Oh, and then there's this. This looks like a buried missile outside of White Sands in the New Mexico desert during war, the post-World War II. And then there's this. All right, let's go closer. Okay, it's got pedals. It's obviously a cylinder. It's got flanges. It's buried halfway in the sands. Here is Steve's comparison. So you can see this is just a few feet away from Curiosity. You land randomly. You look around with a high-resolution camera, and lo and behold, you begin to see all kinds of stuff. Stuff that looks like mangled, high-tech debris. Five minutes. Look at this. This is more. These aren't rocks. Like this thing? Take a look. Here's the one to the right of it. This I love. Notice there's a polished mirror surface, so this is the reflection of the dirt in the bottom half of this uh, whatever this thing is. That obviously, I mean, these are rocks, this is a rock, that's a rock, these aren't rocks, and you don't get geometry and reflections off rocks. All right? You get this kind of mangled metallic effect when you shred high technology. I mean, look at this guy. What is this, a metallic hamburger? It's got a, a groove in the side. It's got bulges. It's obviously been shredded by incredible forces. If you had, remember the scene in, in um, uh, 2012 where you had the JFK, the aircraft carrier, crushing the White House as this huge wave of water swept across Washington from the nine-something earthquake that happened just down the Chesapeake Bay? We're talking that level energies in the catastrophe that totally overwhelmed Mars and everything and everyone that was on it when planet four was destroyed, when it blew up, when the mega energies of the torsion field were released in destroying an entire world. This is the high-tech debris of that catastrophe. Oh, and then there's this one. This is one of my favorites. This is a few hundred feet away which will give you an idea of a scale with the mass cam 34 millimeter camera image. Mountains of the North Rim, look at that. And look at it closer. Ever seen a rock like that? I'll tell you what it does remind me of. The boilers from the Titanic itself. Now, this mission was called Curiosity. This team has exhibited zero, absolutely zero curiosity to go to drive a few feet with a high-tech mega rover that will last a century and use its instrumentation to find out exactly what that thing is. If you think you live in a virtual reality world where everybody from politicians to scientists to news media people are lying to you routinely, regularly, every single night. This is it. And yet, why are we seeing these images? There's two reasons, I think. One is, there's a war going on inside between the good guys and the bad guys. The good guys who are desperate to get us to pay attention to see what's really there. 
and the bad guys who by not holding a press conference and saying officially what's really there, they think that 99.9% .9 of it, remember that one-tenth of one percent that knows, will simply ignore this because, oh, it's just Hoagland talking, and you know he's just spouting nonsense all the time, because it isn't Obama talking about it. We live in a culture where unless it comes from an authority, you can look at this, understand it is this, or something like this, and it will totally be ignored. Model number two. The good guys are leaking this stuff out there so that folks like me can lay it out so you understand what you're seeing in preparation for the sudden dawning of the new age when it will be, in some way, officially admitted. And I don't know tonight which model is correct whether it's just being dangled so that those of us who with eyes can see, understand what's really going on, and most of everybody else who are not in this room are clueless, like they were all clueless about what really happened during the debate the other night, which is incredibly interesting. We'll touch on that tomorrow night a bit. Or it's preparation in the ritual for when they're going to tell us, finally, what's really going on because it's time. It's 2012. It's going to be unveiled as the October surprise of all time. Again, I don't know which model is correct. I can only show you data that incontrovertibly should not be there. Those things aren't rocks. We did not land by accident in this stunningly interesting place. And it will only get, as you'll see in the next couple of minutes, more interesting. This is the drive 400 meters from the landing site, Bradbury Landing, to Glen Elk. Now, this thing is capable, we're told, of 100 meters a day. So they should have been able to drive it in a week, right? They landed August 5th. Today is October 6th. And they're not going to officially get there until the 23rd. What's wrong with this picture? Is it possible that when they get there, they're going to see such stunning stuff that that's going to be the moment when they will have to admit where they are? And, oh, that just happens to be a few days before something called a presidential election. Wow, isn't that special? <laughs> the cameras and technology we've got is so good, and they're being put to such stupid uses. You know, if this is being run the way we really should be running this, there should be nightly views of all this stunning stuff. And there should be running discussions of what it meant and who they were and how they're connected to us and the phenomenal, absolute dawn of a whole new age, not just for the space program, for, for all of humanity. Because think of all the science and technology and medicine and agriculture and energies that could be used to not destroy the earth available by simply understanding what's going on here, what they used, how they had to live with, and maybe, ultimately, finding a library. I mean, you're looking at a basin, at a crater, which is, what, 96 miles across. That is three times the size of the L.A. basin. Imagine what you would find if you came back in 10, 20, 30,000 years and L.A. was in ruin, and you landed a rover to poke around in the ruins of L.A. Eventually, you'd find the public library, you'd find you know, you know, Griffith Observatory, or University of Southern California, or something, and you'd find access to records that would tell you who and what, because you can't even in a cataclysm destroy everything. And believe me, our culture builds such redundancy. And of course, after Al Gore, we have the internet, which is very well protected from <laughs> redundancy. My point is, we're wasting two and a half billion dollars playing at looking at rocks. Here's a satellite view showing some of the early drives. Look, you can actually see the wheel tracks from orbit from almost 200 miles above. This is now a view taken with the uh, Mali camera, which is a microscopic color imager, of the belly underneath looking at what it looks like. I mean, we have the capability of doing amazing things. This is now after the 43rd day. On Mars, days are not called days. They're called sols. S-O-L, which is Latin for sun. Because Mars rotates in 24 hours and 40 minutes. 
and we rotate in 24 hours, so it's about 40 minutes per day extra. So they have to differentiate between the two days, Mars Day, Earth Day, and so Mars Days are called Sols. By the 43rd Sol, there we are. We're right now approaching this edge of where the high thermal inertia region begins, which in my model now says buildings. This is buildings that are buried with a few scraps sticking up, a la the Titanic model where we found pumps and cylinders and weird stuff. But over here, you're going to see it exposed. And that's why it holds more heat at night. That's the Hoagland model. So it's taking us three months to drive 400 meters because in this model, they cannot show it to us too soon. It's on a timetable. It's on a clock. It's on a ritual clock. It's designed to have some political effect in what's coming up at Warp 9, which is this pivotal presidential election. This is a panorama showing the rover tracks, so poignant, lying out behind. Here's more debris encountered en route. Look at this guy. This is interesting. Look at all the detail on the side. But this is the one that I find really amazing. Wow. Look at this. And look at this geometry here. Rocks don't do this. This is junk. This is what civilizations leave behind. This one looks like, notice it's a, it's a part of like, almost like a helmet upside down or a bowl. You see the sculpted geometry, these sharp right angles in the shadow. This was, by the way, taken at dawn. The most amazing shots were taken at dawn. Let me show you another one here. All right, This is the first dawn image they've taken uh, on Sol 44. Why is Sol 44 a dawn shot? Two reasons. One is a dawn shot taken on Sol 44. 44 is also the 44th President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama. And Saul 44, a dawn shot, the President of the United States in the big picture of history is the embodiment, look it up, of Horus. Horus is the Egyptian god of dawn, of sunrise, of the physics. Key artifacts were photographed on Sol 44, including, and I don't have it in this slide collection, or else we'd be here another hour, a little insignia on the rover that looks exactly like Obama's logo from the 2008 election, with the sunrise and the flag and all that, in color on the rover, taken this morning, Sol 44. Oh, and then they looked down and they photographed this. All right. Close up. It's, it's junk. It's metallic junk. Rusted iron junk. Lying on the surface, photographed unmistakably on Sol 44. Here now is an interesting one. This is rectilinear geometry as you're looking out over Glen Elg. All right. Here's a close up. On one of the NASA sites, somebody actually mentioned that this was right angle geometry. And their exact quote, obviously with me in mind, was, oh, this will really bring a thrill to the loonies. That is curiosity. That's scientific questing for the truth. No, there's been a political agenda to keep anything that is so obviously unusual and needs, a, a, you know, at least a question, let alone the answer, from ever coming to mind of these mainstream people who follow NASA's lead like, like little toadies. It's like a couple of people have raised the question, could we find remnants of an ancient civilization? And they are slapped down so hard on these websites with people saying, we do not want to go there. These are the administrators. And these are supposed to be scientific websites. Anyway, here we are. Here's the trek directly east toward Glen Elg, which is over here. And look at this. This is rectilinear geometry seen just before sunset cascading down the terraces. Let me go back one. You're here at the edge where you're looking step, 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 step. As this has been eroded away, revealing what's underneath, this is what you get. 
and the geometry is stunningly obvious. This is just a, I just threw this in because it's just cool. This is the turret. This is where they have the drill, the Mali camera, where they're going to actually drill in Glen Elg to see what the composition is. Again, Grotzinger keeps saying, oh, it's like the Mojave Desert. This is another interesting one. There's all kinds of stuff as you look in detail, but I'm going to show you this. We're almost there. Look at this. What does it look like to you? It looks to me like a collection of ruins sitting on a brow of a hill, like a Roman ruin sitting outside somewhere in Jordan, photographed in late evening with vertical pillars. Look at the even spacing of the pillars. There's a platform, there are some, some towers, there's under supports, a foundation. Again, all this stuff, this is more panoramas showing the cascading terraces that are geometric, looking off toward that amazing thing in the distance, which is right there, the pyramid, one of many. All right, this is a view now of one of the terraces in color. Look at this thing right here. We'll zoom in, all right? And further. All this stuff, you can see a metallic reflection on the backside of this. There's geometry galore. I don't have time to lovingly linger and show you the details. I will show you this. Look at the regular and the, un this is a fragment. These are, these are geometric things that have been torn apart by extraordinary forces and then eroded away after having been submerged by a flood. This is the one that's really astonishing. Look at all these straight lines, all right? Cavities, geometry, geometry, geometry. But this is the one that I looked at and I thought, holy, if Giorgio's not here, I really, we need to get a tape to him because this is what this is. I will bet dollars to navy beans. This is identical to the constructional geometry of a place at the corner of Peru and Bolivia called Puma Punca. And it's not the first time we've seen this with these weird incised H blocks. Look again at the interior square with bevels and then compare it to this and this, same thing, compared to this, compared to this, all right? I believe whoever built Puma Punka came from Mars. And I have some other data that I was unable to get into the computer program, but it'll be up on the website. Finally, we'll kind of skip over this. This is, the, this is an ancient ruin in, a, in, in, in basic erosion. These are manufactured metallic things. Metallic things. Look at this. Metallic, shredded, more bevels. You don't shred rock. This is metallic. It looks like the bevels of Puma Punka. Here is an overview of a platform, a geometric triangular platform, which has enormous capabilities. If they use the laser, they can figure out the metallic composition without having to even go over. This is a wide angle view showing more of this geometry in the distance. Here's part of a vertical wall, platform up here, vertical wall. Look at how eroded this stuff is. It is old. Here's the top of the platform. Look at the squares up on top. These are ruins. They're not rocks. They are ruins. And finally, this little thing over here. Look at this. It's a doorway. Right here. With the shadow on this side, you entered here into whatever is, was over here. These are foundational, these are, these are the remains of the building, but that, you don't get a rock standing vertically with, into, see the geometry, the little squares inside? This is an entrance into whatever was inside this summit mound, all in the shadow of Mount Sharp. The piece resistance. 
Down here in front of the rover, which took its own picture, again reminding me of, you know, short circuit, there was a thing lying right there. When we magnified it, it's a shoe. It's a, it's like a Nike. And the scale, it's a child's shoe lying right next to what appears to be a child's glider. Was this a bedroom? Was this someone who lived and breathed and wondered about the future and hoped for tomorrow and wondered who they were? And if there was someone out there in the galaxy, was this, was this a living, breathing antecedent of ours? And notice the metallic paint and the little stripes here. This is so astonishing that the idea that NASA cannot conceive of it and the only guy in history who actually forecast it was a guy named Ray Bradbury because the centerpiece, the tagline of his epic seminal work, The Martian Chronicles, was, we are the Martians. I believe that this headline, when USA Today changed their format, and put this right next to this. What this should really read is, will we be the first to learn we are the first Martians? This mission deserves far more than it's been given so far. This mission, I think, is the trigger, the penultimate trigger for the transformation of consciousness in 2012 and the question is, will it be allowed to happen? Thank you.